So due to all the violence and the border dispute that was erupting in the 1730s, with Cressup being the main antagonist, there was others that was all involved too, but there was this led to the creation of a, a temporary line. The king actually ordered on May the 25th, 1738, that a temporary line would be run 15 and a quarter miles south of Philadelphia on the east side of the Susquehanna River and 14 and three quarter miles south of the Philadelphia of Philadelphia on the west side of the Susquehanna until the boundary of the two colonies would be permanently fixed. And this was actually relatively close to the current line. Um, not quite the same, but, but relatively close. In a suit filed in English court by the Penn brothers in 1735 against Lord Baltimore, they tried to force Lord Baltimore to adhere to the 1732 agreement that he signed, but refused to follow because of the incorrect map and terms that he did not agree with, but he signed anyhow. Um, 15 years after they filed the suit, which would bring us to 1750, Lord Hardwick of England presented a verdict in the suit which was as follows. The agreement of 1732 had to be carried out. Delaware's southern border would be determined by the false Cape Henlopen, designated on the map that was incorrect when the agreement was done. The circle will be a radius of 12 miles from the center of the town of Newcastle. In particular, from the spire of the courthouse was determined to be the center of the town of Newcastle, Delaware. And then the western boundary will be set at 15 miles south of Philadelphia. The 1750 decision upheld the 1732 agreement and the pens made out like bandits. There's the truck. We can see the truck. And there's the house with the one milestone. Charles Calvert, the fifth Lord Baltimore, who was the fella who signed the 1732 agreement and screwed his entire family out of a bunch of land, died in 1751. The province of Maryland went to his son, Frederick Calvert, sixth Lord Baltimore. Now, Frederick Calvert had no interest in Maryland like his father did, but he only wanted it for one use, as a source of income for his exotic lifestyle, which included leisurely writing, harems of women on multiple continents, drug use, and turning his large estates into a Turkish palace. <laughs> Frederick Calvert fought against the 1750 decision, uh, which up upheld the 1732 agreement, with hopes of undoing his father's mistakes and gaining more land that he could sell to sustain his lavish life. In 1760, the British court upheld the 1750 decision in a, yet another decision or another agreement of, in 1760, and then with a royal decree by the king himself resulted in a new agreement signed on July 4th, 1760, that upheld the 1732 agreement, which was in Penn's favor, of course, because they uh, received a bunch of land, but it eliminated a lot of the court costs to Lord Baltimore, which was in favor of Frederick Calvert. Um, and he just cut his losses and went on with his crazy orgy-related life. So we made it to the top of the mountain, and as you can see over here, there is a marker on this tree, a yellow blaze, and that marks the private property on the other side of the Maryland line, or the Mason-Dixon line. And so that means that that over there is Pennsylvania and we're standing in Maryland. Once again, that's private property. This is uh, supposed to be owned by the uh, public grounds of Maryland, the Indian Springs Wildlife Management Area. And interesting enough, if you look over here, there's a giant pile of rocks running right along the uh, Mason-Dixon line. Um, so we're going to follow this pile of rocks and see if we can find our crown stone. The right, question is, is you got all these yellow marks that are supposed to be on the border. So the question is, is did somebody mark their property line correctly? Or, <laughs> or did they jack the property line up? Or maybe they disagreed with the Mason-Dixon line. 
<laughs> Oops. <laughs> We're looking for a particular rock and among a pile of rocks. Because <laughs> this is all that mountain is, is just a giant pile of rock. Uh, yeah, but it might not be as tall because the leaf litter would have grown up around it. You know, over the years, no one's cleaning it. I don't know. You see, the the uh, wildlife management area ends at the. There should be a creek down in this hollow, and it ends there. It'll run. So maybe that's marking the corner. Ah, uh, what's that white thing in there, over there? Because again, it's not a rock from here. It's from England. England. So you think it would stick out like a sore thumb? That ain't it. Well, let's go over here and see what the heck all this blue markings are. That's it. That's it. It's got to be. Well, I marked it then. Yeah, somebody painted it. That's it. Got it Split. That's it. That is Mal Marker 115 Crown Stone. So we found the Crown Stone. I'll show it to you here in a minute. But that is Mal Marker 115 on the Mason and Dixon line. And uh, luckily, somebody was nice enough to put a bunch of blue markings on like every tree around it so you can't miss the stone uh, so that's pretty cool but anyway uh, to continue our story uh, the 1760 decision upheld a 1732 agreement and it was uh, required that uh, the provinces of Pennsylvania and Maryland would pay to have the line surveyed between their two uh, their two provinces so enter Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon Due to the difficulty of running the tangent line along the western border of Delaware, Maryland and Pennsylvania hired two mathematicians named Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon. And in 1763, they were assigned to assist with the border survey. Mason and Dixon were astronomers who were world renowned for their observations to help pinpoint longitude, longitudinal locations at sea for ships which was a great feat at the time and very needed because people were, you know, getting lost at sea. So using observatory locations, astro astronomy equipment, and surveyor chains, Mason and Dixon, with their team of surveyors, woodcutters, and Indian agents, successfully surveyed the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania. The woodcutters would cut a 12-foot wide straight trail based off of the compass readings across valleys and over mountains. Now imagine, you've seen what we just climbed up, okay? Imagine them having to cut a 12 foot wide swap through that and then, and then march their way up through here carrying all kinds of equipment and then eventually they have to carry these stones up as well. The surveyors were then used compass and surveyor chains to place wooden stakes at each mile along the line. Then, to compensate for the metals in the local hills interfering with the compass reading, Mason and Dixon would set up an observatory, and they would use astronomy equipment such as zenith sector, which measured latitude, and an octant, which measured angles, and a transit and equal altitude instrument used to determine true north by tracking stars where they crossed the meridian. These instruments were used to correct the line based off of the position of the stars. For example, while crossing the Cumberland Valley in modern 
uh, Franklin County, Pennsylvania, the uh, astronomy readings came back that the compass surveyed line was actually off by 800 feet, and so they had to adjust it. The line was corrected by using mathematics for each mile marker to adjust it down to the corrected line. This method was the most accurate way to survey a long distance borderline at the time and was used up until the creation of modern GPS technology. So this method was used to survey the entire line from the false Cape Henlopen in southern Delaware to Indian country in western Pennsylvania. They were forced to turn around once their Indian guides would not cross into enemy Indian territory. Now in 1767, which was the tail end of their survey and everything, they had to mark the line. So they had wooden stakes everywhere, but they didn't have a, a, hard, a hard line marker. So they set stones at every mile, marking the border so it could no longer become an issue. These stones were actually not from America. They were made in England, in English quarries. And the mile stones, as you've seen earlier at mile marker 114, had a P for Pennsylvania on one side and an M for Maryland on the other. The five mile markers had the family crest of Penn on one side and the royal family crest on the other, which I will uh, show you here in a minute. The Calvert's crest uh, actually had a crown on it, um, which you will see. And since their family was part of the royal family, they had a crown. And so thus these markers, every five miles, became known as crown stones. Now, not all the stones were set on the line. Realizing the, the difficulty of transporting and setting these stones in the Appalachian Mountains, they were a lot of them were abandoned just above Clear Spring, Maryland, and they were not set in their intended locations further west on the line. The furthest stone set uh, on the line was actually on the top of Sidling Hill Mountain, just west of Hancock, Maryland uh, today. So as you can see, this is the stone, and this is the Maryland side of the stone. So, you see, here's a crown, four tines on it, and this is the family crest of Maryland. It has a cross right in here, um, and actually part of the family crest um, can be seen in color on the Maryland flag today. Now on the other side is the family crest, or the coat of arms, of Penn. And this is really hard to see because of the moss on the stone. But pen is distinct because it has three dots. And if you look, one, two, three. Three dots. And that is the family coat of arms or the family crest of the Penn family. And this is on the Pennsylvania side. And that is a crown stone. This is crown stone marker 115. So mile marker 114, which is the one with the M and the P on it that we've seen earlier, is an original mile marker set by Mason and Dixon uh, themselves, or at least with their crew. Now this one here is crown stone 115, and it is not the original for this spot. The original that actually set here, it was set here by Mason and Dixon's crew, was removed by the former owner of the land and sent to Baltimore, where it laid in a cellar until 1903. It was recovered during the resurvey of the Mason-Dixon line at the turn of the 20th century and was given to the Pennsylvania Historical Society. A crown stone that was recovered from the pile of stones that were abandoned near Clear Spring, Maryland by the Mason and Dixon crew because they, they could not uh, go any further into the mountains and set these ridiculously big stones on top of mountains and up and over lines and things like that. Um, they actually took one of those stones from that pile and they brought it up here at the, at the turn of the 20th century, about 1905, and they placed it here and uh, by the resurvey team of the, of the, of the, the line. So this isn't the original stones here. It is an original stone, but it was actually meant to be set somewhere further west. And then it was used as a replacement in 1905 to replace the one that was missing here. But this stone was carved 250, over 250 years ago in England. Now, the, the one thing that a lot of people don't understand, these stones are set every single mile from Cape Henlopen in southern Delaware, the whole way to Sidling Hill Mountain, uh, just uh, 
above Hancock, Maryland, or to the west of Hancock, Maryland today. These stones are, as far as I know, are not considered protected property, even though they are historically significant. A lot of them are on private property, um, so they can't be accessed. They're damaged. They're moved because they're in the middle of some farmer's field, and they, they keep hitting them with a plow, and they want to get rid of it. And it's sad to see that these stones are starting to disappear, and they're slowly being forgotten and stuff. Even this one here is weather cracking after only being here for 120 years, and it's uh, it's got weather cracking, and somebody has a, a wire around it to hold it still. But a lot of these stones are not well taken care of. A lot of them are either disappearing under leaf litter or people are removing them because they're becoming obstacles. Um, and it's just sad to see history disappear like that. So we found a crown stone. Did her duty. We found it. So? Now how we get back? <laughs> well, we're not going back the same way we came. Definitely not. <laughs> definitely not definitely not doing that again that wasn't fun so uh we're going to walk out across the ridge south because we're actually can do that because that's public land and then uh according to the map there is a pipeline and we're hoping the pipeline will be a little easier to go down than over a giant power rocks and through a crap ton of uh briar bushes sound good to you sounds good to me okay let's hit it Oh, hell no. <laughs> hell on again. <laughs> Ridiculous, huh? Ridiculous. <laughs> weather <laughs> uh, like you said it could be raining this is what happens when you're on top of a mountain you just get randomly hailed on <laughs> so this is the pipeline. Hey, we got buzzards flying over top of us. That's a good sign, ain't it? <laughs> See if I can fall on my face and record it for posterity. Yeah, but you said it's a bastard from there on out, right? Do you come down through there, or do you come down here? I went down around this way. All right, that's where I'm going to go. Oh, I see the drag mark. <laughs> see, the last time I fell off a cliff, I didn't have good shoes on. This time, I got good shoes on. <sighs> Having fun yet? Oh, good lord. Let's go through the bushes. This isn't mountain climbing. This is surfing. Ooh, there's a rock there. And that rock is moving. Watch this. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> is that rock still going? <laughs> The dangers of climbing and going down mountains. Knocking rocks on other people. AT&T, buried fiber optic cable in the vicinity. Violators subject to persecution. That's what we're looking for, flat and open.
Never going on a hike with you again. <laughs> huh. Old wasp nest. That's cool. It's all flat from here. Nice one. Back there. Yeah, and it's clear. There's no briar bushes yet. yet. This is all day trip. Hey, it usually is when you're with me, Aunt. Civilization. <laughs> now we just got to see if we can get a bridge across that stream so we don't have to cross it with a freaking log. Turkey. Oh, yeah. Gobbler. Yeah, big, big hole. Full water too. <laughs> Look at him go. He running all. And that's how we solve our dilemma on how to get across the creek again. We follow the road with a bridge. Oh, sweet bridge. So we made it back. <laughs> the Mason Dixon line has a very colorful and confusing story that spanned decades and generations. A story that goes way beyond what you may have been taught in high school or college. Though the division of the Civil War is what is usually thought of when we think of the Mason and Dixon line, that generalization masks the true enlightening story of palace intrigue and war that actually existed. Let this be a lesson in how hidden history truly is and why it pays to dig deeper into the subject rather than just disregard hearing it in a country song or reading it in a textbook. From Blair Valley in uh, actually Maryland, Western Maryland, um, we're going to sign off now and uh, uh, thank you Brandon for showing up and yep, you're being my wingman on this uh, on this mountain. Had fun. Had fun. And uh, <laughs> see, see, always likes the adventures, so it's a good sign, anyway. So, uh, if you like this video, um, put a like, write a comment. Uh, if you want to see more, subscribe to the channel. Until next time, see you later.